Here's your word for the day from Calvary in Lake Havasu. Visit us on the web at calvaryaz.com. Well, good morning, Calvary. Thanks for tuning in for your word for the day today. Hope you're having a great Friday wherever you're watching from or whatever day of the week you're watching. It doesn't necessarily matter when this is, but we've been going through the book of 1 Samuel and uh, more specifically, the last couple of days, you and I have been looking at the story of Saul, how Israel got to the place of kind of pushing back against God's leadership and saying, we want a king, how God worked and was merciful to still be involved and present in their, their process of selecting a king and selecting Saul, how he was a, an obscure pick and from a tribe of Benjamin, a small tribe. And, and we aren't told in uh, as explicit of words as I'll say, but the people weren't super excited and stoked about Saul as their king. Well, I don't know if you find the word stoked in the Bible, except if it's talking about a fire, but, but they weren't really excited about him. And so we kind of get this sense that Saul wasn't wildly accepted as king. Like people said, well, we have a king. He's kind of over there doing his own thing. And today in 1 Samuel 11, we'll see a battle that really changes the tide of that, really solidifies him as a leader for the nation of Israel they all see and recognize. And it's kind of an interesting and grotesque uh, process. This might need like a PG-13 rating on some of this. So let's take a look. It says this in 1 Samuel 11, Then Nahash the Ammonite went up and besieged Jabesh Gilead. And all the men of Jabesh said to Nahash, Make a treaty with us that we'll serve you. So they get defeated and they're like, Hey, let's make an agreement so you don't kill all of us. But Nahash the Ammonite said to him, On this condition I'll make a treaty with you, that I gouge out all of your right eyes and thus bring disgrace on all of Israel. It doesn't sound like a great treaty. Hey, I won't kill you. But in exchange, I have to gouge out all of your right eyes. Uh, kind of oddly specific, and again, a little grotesque. The leaders or the elders of Jabesh said to him, Give us seven days' respite that we may send messengers through all the territory of Israel. Then, if there's no one to save us, we'll give ourselves up to you. It's kind of an interesting request. Like, hey, let us see if we can find someone to kill you first. Then, if not, we'll make an agreement with you. When the messengers came to Gibeah of Saul, they reported the matter in the ears of the people, and all the people wept aloud. Now behold, Saul was coming in from the field behind the oxen, and Saul said, What is wrong with the people that they're all weeping? So they told him the news of the men of Jabesh, and the Spirit of God rushed upon Saul when he heard these, and his anger was greatly kindled. He took a yoke of oxen and cut them in pieces. And sent them throughout all the territory of Israel by the hand of the messengers, saying, Whoever does not come out after Saul and Samuel, so shall it be done to his oxen. And the dread of the Lord fell upon the people, and they came out as one man. Kind of an interesting move by Saul to exert his leadership and dominance over the people. Like, hey, if you don't show up and help me, I'm going to kill all of your animals. And this is what they're going to look like. Again, PG-13 rating on this. But Saul is trying to get to that place of saying, I'm supposed to be your leader. You all aren't helping. And by the fact he has to threaten and coerce them kind of shows that they had a pattern probably at this point of not listening. But the people show up. In verse 11, it says, And the next day Saul put the people that had showed up into three companies that came into the midst of the camp in the morning watch and struck down the Ammonites until the heat of the day. And those who survived were scattered so that no two of them were left together. When the people said to Samuel, who is it that said, shall Saul reign over us? Bring out the men that we may put them to death. They're a huge fan now. They're like, hey, if anyone doesn't think that Saul should be our king, we should kill them. People are a little fickle, as you can tell here. Saul said, no, not a man shall be put to death this day. For today, the Lord has worked salvation in Israel. We'll come back to that statement. Then Samuel said to the people, Come, let us go to Gilgal and there renew the kingdom. And all the people went to Gilgal and made Saul king before the Lord in Gilgal. And there they sacrificed peace offerings before the Lord. And Saul and all the men of Israel rejoiced greatly. Saul experienced a great victory here. Again, his, uh, his invitation maybe left a bit to be desired. Uh, bloody animal pieces showing up as the invitation to go to battle is, uh, is an interesting one. But when the people then saw him as the great leader that they wanted to follow, and they said, hey, you better be on Saul's side or else, they also started to praise him. But did you hear what Saul said? He says, for today the Lord has worked salvation in Israel. We're going to see in the, the coming days and weeks that Saul ended up being not such a great king over Israel. 
He didn't uh, really long-term follow and honor God. And yet in this moment, just focus here with me. He experienced a great battle. He had, he had come from a place of obscurity. He had been randomly selected by God uh, by means of Samuel to become a king over his own nation. It would have been very easy for him to go, yes, I'm really good at this. Yes, I'm your king and you should listen to me. But instead, in this moment, he says, no, the Lord has worked and brought salvation in Israel. So let me ask you, who do you credit for the wins and victories in your life? Do you look at that and at the, the good things that are happening, the blessings, the victories, the wins that you're experiencing in your life, and you go, man, I'm so good at this. I've got great ideas. I've got great strategy. I've got good processes. I've got good habits. I've got good whatever, fill in the blank. Or do you look and go, man, God is good and has blessed me abundantly? Do you look at the good things in your life and say, God has brought these to bear? God is the one who has brought this blessing, this victory, this win to take place in my life. Because that's the truth there. James tells us that every good and perfect thing that we have in life is from our Father above. It's not what we do. It's what God brings into our life to bless us and help us. So let me encourage you today. As you end this episode, before you go on about your day or go back to work if you're on your lunch hour or whatever else you might be doing, let me encourage you to pause and just think of three to five things that God has specifically done and brought into your life. Maybe they're little things. Thank Him for your family. Thank Him for your job, if you like it. Thank Him for the ways He's blessed you. Thank you for some of the talents and abilities He's given you. Thank Him for three to five things and just verbally declare before him in prayer that he's the one who has brought those things into your life, not you. And just see how that starts to shift your mind towards worship and gratitude before the Lord. Have a great day, Calvary. We'll see you next time.